Hi, in this video, we'll learn about some interesting hybrid branches of AI. We'll also learn about AI industries, AI applications, applied AI fields, and a lot more, including how everything is connected with each other. This is the final part of artificial intelligence, four levels of explanation. Let's get started. Alright, so we have already discussed the core branches of machine learning which are supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. Now let's talk about hybrid branches which uses a mix of techniques from the core branches. So the two most useful hybrid fields are semi-supervised learning and self-supervised learning. By the way, both of these hybrid fields fall in a category of machine learning called weak supervision. The aim of weak supervision is to come up with approaches that bypasses the time-consuming manual data labeling process involved in supervised learning. And this is a big issue. In today's time, we have lots and lots of data, but we can't just label it all. So we somehow need to use methods that are as effective as supervised learning, but don't require us to label all that data. This is where the hybrid fields come up. All of them are essentially trying to solve the same problem. Now, there are some other weak supervision approaches out there like multi-instance learning and some others, but we won't be going over them in this video. Semi-supervised and self-supervised learning are the most commonly used techniques. All right, let's first talk about semi-supervised learning. This type of learning approach lies in between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. In a semi-supervised learning problem, some of the data is labeled, but most of it is still unlabeled. Unlike supervised or unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning is not a full-fledged branch of machine learning, but rather it's just an approach where you use a combination of supervised and unsupervised learning techniques together. So here's an example of a self-supervised learning approach. So suppose you have a large data set with three classes cats, dogs, and reptiles. So this is how this would work. Step one, you label a portion of this data set. Step two, you train a supervised model on this small labeled data set. Step three, now you test this model on the unlabeled part of the original data set and use the output predictions from this model as labels of the unlabeled examples. Step four, after predicting all the unlabeled examples and generating their labels, train the final model on the complete data set. Now there is one thing which I left out. Since the initial model was trained on a tiny portion of the original dataset, it wouldn't be that strong. So when you're using the predictions of this model to label the examples in step 3, an additional step which you can take is to ignore predictions that have no confidence or confidence below a certain threshold. This way, you can perform multiple passes of predicting and training until your model is confident in predicting most of the examples. This additional step will help you avoid lots of mislabeled examples. And this is just one semi-supervised learning approach. There are many other variations too. It's called semi-supervised learning since you're using both labeled and unlabeled data. This approach is often used when labeling all of the data is too expensive or time consuming. For example, if you're trying to label medical images, then it's really expensive to hire lots of doctors to label thousands of images. So this is where semi-supervised learning would help. Even when you search in Google for something, Google uses a semi-supervised learning approach to determine the relevant web pages to show you based on your query. All right, now let's talk about self-supervised learning, a hybrid field that has gotten a lot of recognition and attention in the last few years. So self-supervised learning is also another type of a weak supervision technique, and it also lies somewhere in between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Self-supervised learning is actually inspired by how we humans as babies pick things up and build up complex relations between objects without supervision. For example, a child can understand how far an object is by just looking at the object's size or tell if a certain object has left the scene or not. And we do all of this without any external information or instruction. Supervised AI algorithms are nowhere close to this level of generalization and complex relation mapping of objects. But still, maybe we can try to build systems that can first learn patterns in the data like unsupervised learning. 
and then understand relations between different parts of the input data and then somehow use that information to label the input data and then train on it just like supervised learning. This in summary is self-supervised learning where the whole intention is to somehow automatically label the training data by finding and exploiting the relations between parts of the input data. This way we don't have to rely on human annotation. For example, in this paper, the authors successfully applied self-supervised learning and used motion segmentation techniques to estimate relative depth of the scene and no human annotations were needed. Here's a workflow of how self-supervised learning would work. So suppose you're trying to train an object detector to detect zebras. Here are the steps that you will follow. Step 1. Take the unlabeled data set and create a pretext task so the model can learn relations in the data. Here's a very basic pretext task. You take each image and randomly crop out a segment from each image and then ask the network to fill this gap. The network will try to fill this gap. You will then compare the network's result with the original cropped segment and determine how wrong was the prediction and relay this feedback back to the network. This whole process will repeat over and over again until the network learns to fill the gaps properly, which would mean the network has learned how a zebra looks like. Step 2. Now just like in semi-supervised learning, you will label a very small portion of the dataset with annotations and train the previous zebra model to learn to predict bounding boxes. Since the model already knows what a zebra looks like, what body parts it consists of, so now it can easily learn to localize it with very few training examples. So this was a very basic example of a self-supervised learning pipeline. I should tell you the pretext task of cropping that I used was very basic. In reality, the pretext task for computer vision used in self-supervised learning are more complex than this. Also, if you know about transfer learning, then you might wonder why not instead of using a pretext task, we instead use transfer learning. Now that could work, but there are a lot of times when the problem we're trying to solve is a lot different than the task that the existing models were trained on. So in those cases, transfer learning doesn't work as efficiently with limited labeled data. I should also mention that although self-supervised learning has been successfully used in language-based tasks, it's still in the adoption and development stage in computer vision tasks. This is because unlike text, it's really hard to predict uncertainty in images. The output is not discrete. There are countless possibilities, meaning there is just not one right answer. To learn more about these challenges, watch Jan Lacoon's ICLR presentation on self-supervised learning. Recently, Google also published a SimCLR network in which they demonstrated an excellent self-supervised learning framework for image data. I would strongly recommend to read this blog post. Uh, there are many intuitive findings in this article which I just can't cover in this video. Alright, besides weak supervision techniques, there are few other methods like transfer learning and active learning. All of these techniques aim to partially or completely automate or reduce the data labeling or the annotation process. And this is a very active area of research these days. Weak supervision techniques are closing the performance gap between them and supervised techniques. In the coming years, I expect to see a wide adoption of peak supervision and other similar techniques where the manual data annotation process is either no longer required or just minimally involved. In fact, here's what Jan Lacoon, one of the pioneers of modern AI says, if artificial intelligence is a cake, self-supervised learning is the bulk of the cake. The next revolution in AI will not be supervised nor purely reinforced. Alright, now I will talk about applied fields of AI, AI industries, applications and I also want to recap and summarize the entire field of AI and address some very common issues. So here's the thing, you might have read or heard these phrases, branches of AI, sub-branches of AI, fields of AI, sub-fields of AI, domains of AI, AI applications, AI industries, AI paradigms, I mean a ton of these catchphrases. So sometimes these phrases are accompanied by words like applied AI branches or major AI branches etc. And here's the issue, I've seen numerous blog posts and people that use these phrases interchangeably. I might be slightly guilty of that too. But the thing is, there's no strong consensus on what the major applied branches or subfields of AI are. It's a huge clutter out there. In fact, I actually googled some of these phrases and clicked to see images. But believe me, it was an abomination to say the least. I mean, the way people had done the categorization of AI branches was an absolute mess. 
I mean seriously, the way people had mixed up AI applications with AI industries and AI branches, it was just chaos. I'm not lying when I say I got a headache watching those graphs. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to draw to draw an abstract overview of the complete field of AI along with branches, subfields, application industries and other things. Now what I'm going to show you is just my personal overview and understanding of the AI field and it can change as I continue to learn. So I don't expect everyone to agree with this categorization. One final note before I start. If you haven't subscribed to this YouTube channel then please do so now. I'm planning to release more such videos so you don't want to miss it. Alright, let's now summarize the entire field of artificial intelligence in just a few minutes. So first off, we have artificial intelligence. Now I'm talking about BKI or ANI, artificial narrow intelligence. Since we have made no real progress in AGI or ASI, we won't be talking about that. Inside AI, there is a subdomain called machine learning. Now the area besides machine learning is called classical AI. This constitutes of rule-based symbolic AI, fuzzy logic, statistical techniques, and other classical methods. The domain of machine learning itself consists of a set of algorithms that can learn from the data. These are support vector machines, random forests, k nearest neighbors, etc. Inside machine learning, there is a subfield called deep learning, which is mostly concerned with hierarchical learning algorithms called deep neural networks. Now there are many types of neural networks, example convolutional network, long short term memory network, and each type consists of any architectures which also have many variations. Now machine learning including deep learning has three core branches or approaches supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. We also have some hybrid branches which combine supervised and unsupervised methods. All of these can be categorized as peak supervision methods. Now when studying machine learning you might also come across learning approaches like transfer learning, active learning and others. These are not broad fields but just learning techniques used in specific circumstances. Alright, now let's take a look at some applied fields of AI. Now there is no strong consensus but according to me there are four applied fields of AI. Computer vision, natural language processing, speech and numerical analysis. All four of these applied fields uses algorithms from either classical AI, machine learning or deep learning. Let's further look into these fields. Computer vision can be split into two categories. Image processing where we manipulate process or transform images and recognition where we analyze content in images and make sense out of it. A lot of times when people are talking about computer vision, they are only referring to the recognition part. Natural language processing can be broadly split into two parts. Natural language understanding where you try to make sense of the textual data interpreted and understand its true meaning. And natural language generation where you try to generate meaningful text. By the way, the task of language translation like in Google Translate uses both NLU and NLG. Speech can also be divided into two categories. Speech recognition or also called speech to text where you try to build systems that can understand speech and correctly predict the right text for it. And the other one is speech generation or text to speech where you try to build systems able to generate realistic human-like speech. And finally, numerical analytics where you analyze numerical data to either gain meaningful insights or do predictive modeling meaning you train models to learn from data and make useful prediction based on it. Now I'm calling this numerical analytics but you can also call this data analytics or data science. I avoided the term data because image text and speech are also data types and if you think about it even data types like image text are converted to numbers at the end. But right now I'm defining numerical analytics as the field that analyzes numerical data other than these three data types. Now since I work in computer vision, let me expand the computer vision field a bit. So both of these categories can be further split into two types, classical vision techniques and modern vision techniques. The only difference between the two types is that modern vision techniques uses only deep learning based methods, whereas classical vision does not. So for example, classical image processing can be things like image resizing, converting an image to grayscale, canny edge detection, etc. Modern image processing can be things like image colorization, etc. Classical recognition can be things like face detection with hard caskets, histogram based object detection, etc. Modern recognition can be things like image classification, object detection using neural networks, etc. So these were applied fields of AI. Alright, now let's look at some applied subfields of AI. I'm defining applied subfields as those fields that are built around certain specialized topics of any of the four applied fields I've mentioned. 
for example extended reality which consists of virtual reality augmented reality and mixed reality is an applied subfield of ai built around a particular set of computer vision algorithms you can even consider extended reality as a subdomain of computer vision it's worth mentioning that most of the computer vision techniques used in extended reality itself falls in another domain of computer vision called geometric computer vision these algorithms deal with the geometric relations between the 3d world and its projections onto the 2d image there are many applied subfields of ai another example would be expert systems an expert system is an ai system which emulates the decision making ability of a human expert so consider medical diagnostic app that can take pictures of your skin and then a computer vision algorithm evaluates the picture to determine if you have any skin diseases or not now this system is performing a task that a dermatologist does so it's an example of an expert system rule based expert systems became really popular in the 1980s and were considered as a major field in ai these systems had two parts a knowledge base a database consisting of all the facts provided by a human expert and an inference engine which used the knowledge base and the observations from the user to give out results although these types of expert systems are still used today they have serious limitations Now the example of the expert system that I just gave is from the healthcare industry and expert systems can be found in other industries too speaking of industries let's talk about ai applications used in industries so these days ai is used in almost any other industry you can think of some popular categories are automotive finance healthcare robotics and others within each industry you will find ai applications like self driving cars fraud detection etc all these applications are using methods and techniques from one of the four applied fields of ai There are many applications that fall in multiple industries. For example, a humanoid robot built for amusement will fall in robotics and the entertainment industry. Self-driving car technologies fall into the transportation and the autonomous industry. Also, an industry may be split into subcategories. For example, digital media can be split into social media, streaming media, and other niche industries. By the way, most of the media sites use recommendation systems, which is yet another applied subfield of AI. All right. So this was a high level overview of the complete field of AI. Not everyone would agree with this categorization, but this categorization is necessary when you're deciding which area of AI to focus on and how all the fields are connected to each other. And personally, I think this is one of the simplest and the most intuitive overview of the AI field that you will find out there. This concludes the fourth and the final part of artificial intelligence four levels of explanation series. If you enjoyed this episode of Computer Vision for Everyone, then do subscribe to this channel and share it with your colleagues. All the important points mentioned in this video are summarized in an infographic which you can download from the blog post version of this video. Link for that is in the description below. And see you in the next video. Thank you.